Hi, everyone. Um, my name is May Bateron. I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Forder, and we're going to do the Ask the Dev panel now. So why don't each of you go ahead and present yourself, and then we're going to ask some good questions. All right. So I am Morel. I think I'm the only one of the devs you haven't met yet. Um, I'm from M0, been working there for about four or five years or so um, as a principal engineer, and also I've been working in OpenTO for pretty much since it started. Hello, I'm Ronnie. I'm also working in N0 for the last two years, but in the last year I've been donated completely to the OpenTO project, and I've been working on that. Hi, I'm Christian Mesh. I'm the tech lead at OpenTofu, sponsored by Spacelift. And I've been working on the project for just over a year now. Amazing. OK. So I think a good start would be to talk about experiences. And so I would like to ask each of you, as a developer, what's it like working on OpenTofu? Yeah, so it's been a very unique and interesting experience. Um, Ever since starting out with the fork and everything was very hazy and we had to like hit the ground running and understand, okay, what do we do now and how do we get things going, what do we have to do, what don't we have to do or we, we shouldn't do. I think Christian touched upon that in his talk as well. And uh, there were a lot of question marks that uh, after a while we figured out, okay, we have to do this, we have to do the registry. So there were a lot of challenges that we had to deal with without like having full clear view of what we have to do. So that was an interesting challenge. And like building a process, again, we started with nothing. And we this started with some issues with getting like community contributions. And we had to build a process uh, bit by bit. So all of this has been really interesting experience. And I learned a lot from it. Um, so for me, like at first, it was an honor. Uh, I'm working like on Terraform and now open tofu and using that for the last few years. And it was an amazing opportunity just enhancing this amazing tool and by listening to the community and really giving them what they want. Uh, but also, also it was really hard. Uh, it's a large go code base. There are a lot of weird historical quirks and like weird complexities that takes time to understand. And at the beginning, it was just like looking at the code and like blinking, not understand how everything connects together. Uh, but taking the time and, and being like really stubborn and digging into the code and starting to see how everything connects. So it's really rewarding and I love it. I don't have too much to add on top of what RL and Ronnie have <coughs> excuse me, uh, said already, but it's been phenomenal working with this team and with the community. It's I get up every morning ready to see, oh my gosh, we now have 50 new GitHub notifications we have to respond to. We've got four new pull requests. And it's just jumping in and helping the community make what their vision is a reality. Um, being, I, I think we're all kind of service oriented people. We want to serve the community. We want to serve the people who are invested in this project and invested in this ecosystem. And being able to make that a reality means that I get up every morning excited and ready to work. OK, well, I guess that now we can hear your enthusiasm and, and why you're all there. Um, let me ask you a, maybe a tough question. So as a user, why should I use OpenTofu? Convince me. Or you know, just say say a good a few good things. You don't have to really convince me. I'm just interested. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> um... Um, I think a lot of people here like, understand the need for infrastructure as code in general, and OpenTOF is based upon a tool that is widely used in like everywhere pretty much, and um, we have a great ecosystem that goes along with it. And specifically, OpenTOFU, what we're trying to do is, I think again, Christian talked about it, but we want to do what the community actually wants and focus mainly on what people want and drive it to be better for like the common user and not specifically enterprises or stuff like that. So that's our goal. And I think that's a good reason to use it. 
I think another good reason is that we try to be remarkably responsive on GitHub. So if you have an issue, we are there pretty much day of getting more information, figuring out what's going on. I have, I also have my calendar open uh, such that you can go to my GitHub profile, click, put a meeting on my calendar, and I'll come say hi. We can talk about issues. We can talk about stuff you're struggling with, different ideas you have, helping refining issues. I have someone who contacts me on a regular basis who has, going back to the TerraLith uh, that was talked about earlier, has a massive, massive project, 20, 30, 40,000 resources, absolutely massive state file. And we just sit down, run a debugger, and try and find different ways of optimizing the code. I think we found some like 40% memory reductions, found a couple places where there was uh, exponential uh, algorithms within the code that we were able to break out, but that's, it's the, we're here, we're available to talk, and we're excited to work with you on making this tool better, which is kind of what RL said already. Yeah, and I think like an important thing to add is that it's really easy to try Open Tofu and switch back easily back to Terraform. Uh, in Open Tofu 1.8, we released support for the .tofu extension, uh, which means that if you want to try Open Tofu specific features, you can just duplicate your TF file and um, try and play with it in a .tofu file and so if when Tofu sees like both uh, a TF file and Tofu file with the same name, it ignores the TF file. So you can be sure that your configura configuration stays the same way as it was. And like migrating back is just really easy. Well, I think that this actually touches a um, very interesting or important subject because the fact that uh, this option is now available. Like what happens if I want to go back? What happens if I have both? Because um, I guess a lot of places won't, are not starting on a greenfield nowadays, right? Like there's going to be a migration, but we're still interested. Maybe we want to replace something. So there are concerns that people have in their mind when they're thinking about migrating, it's not gonna prevent them from trying, but what, are, what do you have to say to those people who have these concerns? Um, what are the main concerns that you're all familiar with? Yeah, so I think we also heard it in one of the questions in one of the previous sessions as well. Yeah, people are, um, enterprises as well, are concerned about it and um, well, what I can say specifically is I think we have a great team here that makes an amazing product and uh, having um, Open Tofu be under the Linux Foundation is something to consider because it makes sure the project is actually going in the way that the community wants and is something that's going to be supported for years to come. And I'm hoping that with time, people will see that we are trying to have features that everybody wants and that will be reason enough for people to try out open tofu and take the risk as ronnie said before it's easy to try out and go back so yeah so there's also some common misconceptions about providers i one of the most frequent i'm sorry if i'm st stealing your answer ronnie but um <laughs> So the providers are the glue that connects OpenTofu and Terraform to your infrastructure or to your pizza place. There are some providers that you can say, tofu apply, and it sends you a pizza. Anyways, um, it, it's Go code, it can do pretty much anything. But that connection is critical for the ecosystem. It is based on a protocol that HashiCorp put together years ago and has upgraded over time, but there are, there's over 4,000 providers written against the existing protocol. That's not going to change anytime soon. OpenTofu has its 1.0 compatibility promise, as well as Terraform. There may be new features added to this API, but it is going to be supported in the long term. Switching from OpenTofu to Terraform or vice versa, the providers are going to be exactly the same. Uh, one of the other concerns is, well, what happens if they try to rogue pull the providers? A lot of the most commonly used providers such as AWS and Google are hosted on GitHub, but they are under HashiCorp's GitHub organization. Uh, fortunately for us, there is no contributor license agreement associated. So if you were to try and relicense any of the core providers that you all are likely using today, you would have to get sign-offs from thousands of contributors across dozens of companies, which functionally means it's 
going to be a nigh on impossible task to do. Um, so I, at least I personally don't worry about the future of the provider ecosystem and the existing providers that are running today. And there's no plans on deprecating any support for that going forwards. Obadofu might add some additional features that providers could opt into, but again, our main focus there is the provider protocol is sacred, that is something that we are planning on supporting long term, and it, it should not be an issue with switching between OpenTofu, Terraform, or related tooling. And the way I see it, there are so many concerns, but on the other hand, it's our job to actually give people reason to switch over. So that's what we're doing. We're really trying to listen to the community and implement features that people have been asking for years. Uh, and I think that's like up to us to create a really good tool and we're working really hard to make it a reality. I, I, um, I have one more thing yes. I thought about. Um, specifically, you can see in the ecosystem uh, that it's starting to really like adopt open tofu natively in a lot of stuff. You can see it in a lot of projects in Turgon and Atlantis, and you can also see it with JetBrains now actually going to add native tofu support. So it's actually becoming like a project that a lot of the industry is starting to support. I think this uh, approach is important if you want to bring something new to uh, the communities, especially in an area where the existing tech stack has been there for so long. So, good. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about what's next. Tell us a little bit. What, what, what are you cooking there? <laughs> you see the reference? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have uh, the 1.9 alpha out right now, um, which has a bunch of new features. Uh, one of them is an exclude flag. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the ask for this. This has been one of the most um, requested features uh, in a long time. Uh, there's the target flag and exclude is just the opposite of that. You can exclude specific resources or modules and make sure you plan and apply everything else or everything that is not dependent on them. And it's very useful in a bunch of use cases. Uh, sometimes it's when you need to remediate some um, hiccup in your configuration and you just want to not uh, deploy a specific resource or sometimes in like multi-stage applies, it's also helpful in some, uh, such scenarios. So this is one feature that's gonna be added, which is cool. Yeah, um, another big feature that we're releasing uh, is for each on providers. Uh, I had a chance to work on it with Christian and Alexander and other people on the team. It's quite a big feature. It touched a lot of places in the code base. Yeah, um, and it's really cool because it lets you iterate. If you have resources or modules, you can iterate over your providers. And like the the use case that I've had for this before is I like implemented disaster recovery for, for my infrastructure and it was really a pain doing that, but now I can iterate over different providers that use different regions, so uh, it's amazing. And like I can't wait to hear the feedback um, about this. So go try that alpha. We're really excited to see what people use it for. Um, as far as from my point of view, uh, we can start talking a little bit about OpenTofu 1.10 and what's coming after that. So on the core team, we're trying to prep a couple of the larger RFCs so that we can start discussing them with the community and putting them on the roadmap, potentially for 110. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, supporting for alternate backends, custom backends, and getting those tuned to the inf your infrastructure. Um, it's a very complicated issue and there's a lot of proposals there. We're trying to come up with a comprehensive step-by-step -step process that will allow us to both improve existing backends, make them more flexible, and open up the door for people to start bringing their own backend, or potentially running an older or a newer version of a backend so it's not necessarily tied to your OpenTofu version. So if you wanna, for example, use a new S3 feature with S3 backend, one of the, one of the potential paths we're looking at is the ability to use uh, to decouple your backend version from OpenTofu itself, so it's not shipped with the binary. Um, what exactly, what exact form that will take is 
going to be up to you guys. That is, we're putting together, we're trying to uh, coalesce together what the community has been asking for, try and find the best, some of the best technical solutions, and then really have a rigorous discussion on what the pros and cons are, what some of the technical challenges are, where different community members might want to jump in and help prototyping or experimenting with different pieces before we really jump into locking into a design. But I'm really excited for that process. We're really pushing the RFC process to its limits. And what's really fun is we've been iterating on the RFC process itself. We recently merged a PR, or sorry, we didn't merge, but we've got in discussion a PR to help track the results of the RFC through GitHub Better to provide more transparency, more accountability for how different things are scheduled once they've been discussed at length. Um, so we're, rap we're iterating our process as we're discovering new things ourselves. And, what, and when the community says, hey, this isn't working for us, we try and take a step back and find a better way forward. Um, okay, so that's interesting because you you all told us about what's coming next, and I think an interesting thing to ask you is um, how do you how do you decide what's coming next? How do you decide on okay, we're gonna do this feature instead of this one, or the order? What's tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's basically a lot of what Christian has just said. Um, at the beginning, it was mostly uh, based around POCs that either the um, core team has started working on or a community. And um, it's become mainly us listening to the community, right? Uh, we hear a lot on issues. That's why we ask people to uh, create issues and, and respond there, right? But also we hear some stuff on like social media in our Slack and even in conventions like this one, that's where we hear a lot of the, the feedback as well. So uh, we base everything on what the community actually wants. And I think backends is a great example because uh, we also have to not like think short-sightedly. We need to figure out like the whole picture sometimes. We, we got a lot of issues that had to deal with different issues with backends or, or feature enhancements. And then that's why we had now the RFC of future of, of backends. Okay, how do we deal with that in the way that they'll help everyone pretty much? So I can talk a little bit about my role as tech lead and how we take all of this incoming information and turn it into a roadmap. Uh, as I've said in previously today, the we're listening to the community, we're trying to put our fingers on the pulse to figure out what is being asked for, what's the top priority, what should we be spending our time on as the core team to, to start enabling community members to build. Um, but on the functional level, I sit down with the core team uh, after every release and we talk through what is the community asking for, what are projects that are long-term investments that we want to start investing in, um, either through RFCs or issues that have been open for a while or have a lot of votes. We put together a roadmap, uh, a, a tentative roadmap, bring that to the technical steering committee, go through that in detail, talk about how much time we have on the core team, what different co uh, commitments have been made from the community to dedicate resources to building or testing features. And then we put it in a milestone and start chipping away at it. Um, one of my goals as tech lead is to add, uh, to improve the transparency into that process. Um, and that's something hopefully we'll be, we'll be working on for 110 and 111 so you get a better idea of it's not just open to it for core devs, put together a milestone and it goes out. It's uh, the core devs say, are saying, this is what we see the community is asking for, this is what we're going to try and do. But if you look for the ch at the change log for 19, there's, I think there's more entries that are non, not from the core team than are. Like the core team's been working on the big features that we mentioned, but the community's been also doing important work figuring out new things, enhancements, bug fixes that are important to them, and we're getting that in just the same. The roadmap is not set in stone. It is a, this is kind of where we're heading. We're trying to communicate what we're doing to the community and what the core team is trying to focus on based on the torrent of issues that come our way. Uh, but at the end of the day, our priority is what are the users, what, what, are, the, what are the contributors sending our way? What are we trying to get in? Um, and yeah. yeah, and this is a good opportunity to like remind you, if you have an issue, you have a use case, you're missing a feature, 
um, go to our issues, search for this feature. Uh, if it doesn't exist, open it. If it exists, upvote. And please also write your scenario that this is a tool that has so many use cases that we're always trying to learn and understand exactly how people use it uh, in order to really understand how to create the best features that fits all, like not all, but the main uh, problems. And yeah, like go ahead and do that. We're looking at, at it at least weekly, if not like daily. So it sounds like um, you have the, the community up at the top where even if it's uh, listening to their uh, requests or uh, having them involved. And I do want to ask about the community involvement um, in how, how does this process work? But let's say somebody wants to join in. Is there an onboarding? How do we do that? Can I join? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> everyone can. Um, yeah, I think like with a lot of other um, open source projects, we have the contribution MD, uh, contributing MD, uh, and it just states how you can contribute. We state there that for us, the main thing you can contribute with is issues, because as we've said right now, it really affects how and where we take the project to. So just creating new issues and interacting in issues is really helpful. Um, but if you are specifically set on uh, contributing code, then of course we have a sections on that. And uh, for issues that we've accepted, a bunch of them have like the most want the, the help wanted label. And for issues that are either simpler or are in a more like isolated part of the code base, we have good first issue because it's it's good for just starting out if you don't know the code base at all. And um, and yeah, and as for just starting out, we do want to have like um, better onboarding material, but right now we have like art architecture material and we really recommend people to uh, interact in Slack because uh, people ask questions there often and the core team and just other community members uh, always answer them it, it, with contributions and also with everything else, just help with configuration. So. Yeah, just to, to quickly add on to that, we're actively developing a guide saying, okay, I have these skills, I have interest in open tofu, how can I contribute? Uh, so we're trying to put together a matrix of like, I know TypeScript, I know Go, I have a really strong uh, thoughts about testing, where can I jump in? Um, so that's actively under development and you are, we're, we're, we're going to talk because you have some thoughts on this. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So. It's not only like we have the open tofu repository, but we have other repositories, like we have the website and we have the registry, and they're also like written in different languages. So we need a skill set for like we have we need a various uh, skill sets. So you're more than welcome to jump in and see how you can help with a good first issue, uh, as Arel mentioned. Uh, yeah, and it's something that we keep thinking about. Like for example. Right now, we're hiring and we're thinking about how to onboard the person who will join the team. And like we started thinking, okay, well, finally, like we're an organized team now after like the last year. So let's create a good onboarding uh, process and take these materials and why wouldn't we share them with the community? So it's also something that we're starting to think about and we'll definitely keep in touch with me about it. I, I love it that I asked in front of everyone. I kind of put them on spot and now they have to have me, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we move on to one of the last questions, um, if anyone here has any question, um, feel free to go to this microphone over there. It's very lonely right now, so the microphone is lonely. So uh, if anyone wants to jump in and ask a question, make a comment, say something nice about the all of those, I love the cubes. Isn't it so, like, it's just, I had to say something. It's all these cubes. I love it. I love it. Okay, so uh, ask, ask more questions. And before uh, we do that, um, we're getting close to the end. And I think that would be a good time to start spilling the tea. Ha, give us some juice. 
I'm sure it wasn't all easy. You're all like, yes, it's nice, it's wonderful, we love each other. Names, addresses, spill the tea, tell us what were the hurdles. You can also provide a few valuable lessons, but you know, juice, we want juice. Go ahead. All right. Um, I think for me specifically, um, the main hurdles were something I mentioned at the beginning, all the question marks that we've had. Um, so one of them was like, for me personally, the registry that we figured out, oh, we have to create our own registry because of the terms of in service uh, change. Um, so that was like a big setback. We didn't know we had to do that, but the process of dealing with that, that was really interesting and I learned a lot from it. We created a bunch of different RFCs. We wanted to involve the community as much as we could. So we created a lot, bunch of RFCs of, okay, how are we gonna do this? And we've created, we ended up picking the one that was more uh, open source uh, as we saw it because we wanted the core team to not deal with maintenance or at least as much as possible and also to have everything be as visible as possible so we had like all the provisors and modules are available in a github repository and you can see like in github actions if synchronization worked or not so um, that's a great, a cool solution, and I think I really learned there, like how the community, how much power it has, and how much expertise the community has, because um, we based this. Um, it was kind of inspired by how Homebrew works with Homebrew Core, and when I created the RFC, then the Homebrew project lead like commented on the RFC and gave some recommendations on how to handle folder structure for like better performance with Git. So that was really helpful. Um, That's awesome. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, like, I think that I learned that communication is hard, like obviously, <laughs> but in a more specific way, um, when we started, like, I feel we are a team of very self-sufficient engineer. Uh, you tell us to do something and we'll just do it. And we started like writing RFCs and commenting on RFCs. And we were all thinking, okay, we're on the same page on this. And we started developing. And then we saw that like not really, people had different plans and saw things differently. Uh, and we started to change our RFC process. We added um, a part that really explains the way, how, how things works right now. Um, because like everybody here was working on this huge new code base. So we were also figuring it out and understanding how we can preserve this information and ensure that we're not siloing it inside the team. Uh, like in like the, a specific individual knows a lot about this and, and we really thought about how to share it with the team. And one of the lessons I really learned from that is that uh, there are no stupid questions. Like we need to ask everything and understand everything to the smallest detail, uh, especially like when we want to work on this big features together. Uh, and do you feel that this is how it is right now that people, other people feel the same way that do you see a change more questions are being asked or yeah okay. I do I think like we're way more in tune uh, we're like one of the first thing we're asking okay so how this works right now and we're also like we added this uh, process where we we want to start working on something so we read the RFC together as a team and like everybody stops and ask for uh, everything that they didn't uh, understand and it's like really cool seeing that and us evolving as a team. Yeah, it's it's getting a little bit tricky as we get spread across more time zones, but we're we're still making a commitment, which just means some long hours for for folks. Uh, I think for me, I think the one of the biggest challenges has been the fact that we are very similar to a visible source, not necessarily open source tool, uh, and trying to review uh, users' contributions, making sure we have a process in place that protects against that, uh, against someone from misappropriating source. Um, I, I talked about that a little bit in my talk, but it's 
it's a concern we have. It's something we have a process in place. We spoke with the Linux Foundation. But anytime we get a user contribution that is a feature that has been asked for in Terraform, it is something we have to be very diligent about reviewing uh, within our, 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 with, within our own internal team. Um, we also dealt with a cease and desist for, uh, uh, that got sent to us. I can't comment on that too much because as you can imagine, lawyers have some very strong ideas on how that should be responded to, but we were as open and as clear as we could be in our blog post responding to it. And I want to thank all the core devs that took the week to put that together, to put together the very clear rebuttal to the claims that were made. And uh, I wanted to thank the community for the response and that. That was probably the worst week a lot of us had in open tofu is, what what do we how do we respond to this? How do we not put our foot on put on our mouths? How do we keep the lawyers happy? And we said what we could in the community. Their response, their analysis of what we put out was incredibly positive. And I would like to thank each and every one of you who showed their support for that. So. Okay, I I have a question. It's a, it's a short one, really. How long <laughs> how long did it take you to? get your breath again after you got that season is it like I just need to know when did you wh when were you able to breathe again just give like roughly <laughs> uh, so it took about a week for us to put together our response okay um, I think some of us are still crossing our fingers but okay. we did we did change a few things in our internal process to make sure that when we if if something like this happens again we do have a team and a plan in place to respond to it yeah uh, quickly and accurately all right, I see. I see. Yay! Yeah. The mic is not lonely anymore. Good for you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, so you spoke a little bit about contributions coming in that could be potentially from a visible source repo, um, and that you have your own way of detecting that. Uh, what about the opposite? Uh, what, what's going on about you know any features that might be implemented to Open Tofu? I mean the could be contributed to that visible source that seems valid. Um, I guess what happens when it gets turned around on you and it says, hey, we, we own this code now. Um, are there guardrails and what, what does it look legally for you? Um, so yeah, it can happen and we might have seen it also happens in previous ver it, like versions of Open Tofu. Um, and like, it's okay, we're open source. So it's okay, why not? So as far as the code in OpenTofu, that is MPL licensed, and without the without the sign off from the author, uh, it they can implement similar to how we can implement similar ideas to Terraform. They can implement similar ideas to us. A good example of that is template string. We both implemented roughly the same thing. We did that first. They followed because it was useful, um, and we do have some people who contribute PRs to both OpenTofu and Terraform that have nearly identical code. We're happy about that. It's I think it's, we don't have any problem with it. Um, but we, I know I don't personally look at the Terraform repo to see if they're copying any of our, copying any of our code, but hopefully they don't. And, and just a really quick follow-up with Gen AI. How does that all work? Uh, reading from the OpenTofu repo. <laughs> so, so they're free to, to learn from the Open Dofa repo given the license. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to comment on that too much. But uh, it, it, as far as contributing to Open Dofa, we you cannot use an LLM because of visible source. It is something that we try and keep an eye out for. And it's an illegal gray area that I'm not a lawyer and I can't right. really comment on other than that we're not comfortable with people using it to contribute to Open Tofu. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's part of our gu guidelines, actually, that please don't use any LLM. Thank you. Hello, yes, um, I'm a security engineer, so I'm interested with you being open source. We always hear about supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. Uh, what are some of the stories that you have about being open source and having to deal with contributions and stuff like that, and then security in general? So, uh, as far as security and open tofu, we do have some requests for like SB, S bombs and things like that. So if you feel strongly about that, upvote that issue and that'll put it on our radar. Uh, as far as security goes, we actually had someone who works for a bank come in and help us build the state encryption feature. Uh, 
This is a feature that has been requested for a very long time. This contributor was actually running a fork of Terraform for years internally at the, at the company to add this much needed security feature. Um, so we are excited that they took the time to work with us and build that feature out in OpenTofu. And there's been an interesting response on the Terraform side of things. They're focusing on ephemeral values. I personally think it's, a, it's two sides of the same coin. Having your state file encrypted is a good thing. People can't, l just if they get access to your S3 bucket, they can't learn things about your infrastructure. If there are mistakes in what's been protected and what's not, that is encrypted. It's, it's adding an additional layer. Um, as far as ephemeral goes, that's something we'll be looking into for 110 and a discussion we'll have with the community. Um, as far as other security concerns, uh, we do uh, have ways that people can disclose, disclose security concerns to us. Um, we have found some issues in providers where some providers, would, so when someone would submit a log to us saying, hey, I went through and ran this with the debug logs and it's logging my, it, it ended up logging a password. We deleted that from GitHub and we contacted the provider authors and said, hey, let's work together on fixing this. All right. I keep looking there because it says the time and we are out of time. We have a little bit more, so we're not. Anyone else wants to ask another question? Yay. I have one question, and I think it relates a bit to the confidence that you talked about in migrating to OpenTofu with, so specifically regards to testing. As a project that relies so much on modules and providers, how can you, how do you test or even approach testing OpenTofu to make sure that enterprises, companies have confidence that what they have now will work with it? I, I, I can take a, take a first, first stab at that. So there's an existing large test suite uh, that came with OpenTofu slash Terraform 155. That's when the fork happened. So we've been working on expanding those existing tests and kind of taking a step back and thinking, okay, this is a large application with a fair amount of tech debt, if I'm being perfectly honest, and trying to refactor that or make large sweeping improvements to it is very hard without the right testing harness in place. So I am working on trying to put together an RFC that I'm really interested to see what the community thinks about that is trying to encapsulate as much of what we can test as possible and in ways that make sense. Like if you're gonna refactor how a bunch of the internal of the application works, those existing tests are gonna be broken in pretty horrific ways. Um, so there are existing tests. We do run them on a regular basis across all of the architectures. Actually, OpenTofu uh, runs those tests on x86, or uh, uh, runs them on 32-bit uh, x86, uh, and we actually had to fix a bunch of bugs in order to get those to pass. So I don't know if Terraform's fixed those, but hey, if you're running a really old system, you may actually have better luck with OpenTofu for that. Um, it's a weird set of uh, bug fixes, but in any case, uh, we're actively working on defining what our testing strategy is moving forward, where we want to focus now, where we want to focus on in the future. I personally want to create a uh, testing uh, safety net around the application such that we can start doing these more intense refactorings within the application, get our coverage numbers up, and then start figuring out where are the more focused testing should happen. Um, but we're learning the application this is an active discussion, and uh, we're excited to have that conversation with the community and to add reliability where we can. Yeah, um, I totally agree. Like, we have all sorts of POCs. Like, we even thought about creating E2E tests uh, using local stack. Um, so it's something we're actively working on and seeing how it goes. Anything else? Okay, so if there are any, any last, last question, but quick, quick, <laughs> last question. Quick. I don't know if it'll be quick, but um, I, I do have a question around Terraform's implementation of stacks. Um, I kind of see that as like, hey, what is the, <laughs> that was a good, good mic pass. Um, okay. Maybe the short of it, uh, instead of taking a bunch of time, do you think we'll do it? Do you think OpenTofu will implement that feature? 
I think the best thing I can say is we're actively talking with Terragrunt, who implements something to my very limited understanding is similar today. There's, a, there's an ongoing discussion of what should live in tools surrounding OpenTofu and what, should, what level of granularity should OpenTofu have itself. So there's an active and very uh, vigorous debate going on our GitHub at the moment, so feel free to chime in on that. Uh, it's, it's, it's something we're trying to figure out. Cool. All right. So with that, I will say thank you. And thanks to everyone who were here listening, asking questions. Amazing. Give it up for these guys. Come on.